I'd like to invite Swati um, uh, to come uh, down to the front. I'm actually going to talk about Sri Lanka first and then about Andhra Pradesh. We've heard a lot about Andhra Pradesh because it's, please come, come up here. Um, we, we, we've uh, heard a lot about Andhra Pradesh because it's perhaps one of the biggest um, agroecological um, transformations um, uh, that, that's actually uh, happening. But let me start with, ah, can, can we get the presentation up on the, the main screen or do I have to do something? Ah, it is there, fantastic. So um, the first project is a GCF, um, uh, Global Climate Fund investment uh, in Sri Lanka. It actually was a long time in its genesis. We started in 2017 with a national workshop on uh, soil health is national wealth. Um, and it brought a lot of people together to develop a common framework to address contrastic problems in different parts of uh, the island of Sri Lanka. Small uh, island uh, uh, country, but huge uh, diversity. Um, and the interesting thing is that in different bits of the island, you've got completely different things going on. So in some places, you've got excess application of agrochemicals, floods, uh, big problems with pollutions, with disease that's um, been associated with, with pollution. And then on, on other parts of the island, you've got insufficient access to inputs um, and droughts and problems of very low productivity. And so it became very clear during this that the well-being uh, of different people is, is differentially affected. The economy, the health, um, forests, agriculture, water and soil are all sort of intimately connected. But in the country, these are all dealt with by different institutions and just getting them together to start understanding um, how do they work together to actually tackle these solutions is what's led, what led um, to uh, this GCF uh, program. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Sri Lanka, but the whole food security uh, of the country is based on the transfer of water from the wet highlands via storage in reservoirs to the dry lowlands where irrigated uh, rice is grown. And that's actually an ancient system. So it's not just, <laughs> there have been massive increases in reservoir capacity uh, in, in recent years, but it's an ancient system going back for, for, for thousands of years um, of that uh, storage and transfer uh, of water. Now, what's climate change uh, doing to Sri Lanka? Well, there's a double whammy because um, um, uh, the global circulation models um, predict uh, that um, um, in key months in the year, you get higher, more intense rainfall in the uplands, which increases the, uh, increases the erosion and, and therefore sediment flow into the reservoirs. That reduces reservoir capacity. But at the same time, in the dry areas, in the key growing months, you're getting more frequent and more severe drought. You're getting higher temperatures, which means that potential evapotranspiration goes up. So you've got a problem of less water storage capacity when you need more water in order to um, uh, grow, uh, grow maize. So that's the problem complex that you're trying to, uh, trying to tackle. Um, and it's associated with uh, um, uh, 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 an increase in the prevalence of erosion. This is a decadal analysis from 2002 to 2012 using the land degradation surveillance framework mechanism and satellite image analysis based uh, 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 on it. Um, and uh, lower, um, um, so the, the, the increase in erosion obviously affects uh, storage capacity of reservoirs. And reducing soil carbon obviously is a problem both in terms of the emissions associated with that uh, soil carbon having, having gone and, and lower uh, storage capacity, as well as, of course, the agricultural potential um, uh, as a result of that, that uh, reduction in soil organic matter. So what is the GCF project trying to, trying to do in order to uh, uh, tackle this? 
Um, and it's basically got three critical components. A large part of the expenditure, by far the, the, the biggest expenditure, is actually um, um, implementation of innovations on the ground with uh, farmers and, and other uh, um, um, actors to improve land and water management in the highland areas to reduce the sediment flow. Um, and that includes um, um, roadside, streamside uh, uh, um, interventions, managing um, um, water flow across the, the, the landscape, improving um, um, what is happening there. And uh, then, of course, in the downstream areas, you also need more sustainable uh, agricultural production, basically uh, agroecological transition in terms of how um, um, uh, the agricultural production is managed. But you can only do this if you can finance it. So the blue elements here at the bottom are, are the finance components, and they fit into, there are two key elements. One is an innovative innovative payment for environmental services mechanism so that the value of water that's being used can be captured and redirected to these interventions to uh, um, sustain the integrity of the catchment area that the water comes from. And the government already agreed to do a levy on um, hydropower uh, um, uh, production from reservoirs um, and some of that money being redirected to um, these, uh, this uh, agroecological transition. The second way in which you make it sustainable is to upgrade the value chains, to make uh, it more sustainable, to capture more value from a green economy. So um, getting uh, more processing artisanal coffee and, and chocolate production, for example, um, um, so that more of the value of product is retained within the landscape that allows financing of, of better practices. And the third element is governance and appropriate rural advisory services. So you can't uh, actually manage watersheds very easily at the moment because the administrative boundaries, which is where decisions are made about policy, are non-congruent with the water, the natural watershed boundaries. So you need new governance mechanisms that cut across those, and you need to be able to bring evidence about what is happening in those landscapes to inform decisions. So um, um, dashboards that bring together information about the, the uh, uh, that are monitoring the extent to which um, uh, you're being successful in reducing um, um, soil erosion and, and, and reservoir capacity, um, uh, uh, agricultural productivity and so on, become critical for informing the decisions. And using a shared methodology, um, which is stakeholder uh, based, um, um, and it's not so much decision support as negotiation support, because you've got a participatory decision making process where you're trying to get the different people who've got different interests in the landscape negotiating uh, better decisions and using evidence um, to, make that, uh, to make that happen. And of course, you need then your integrated rural advisory services to be tackling the options by context nature of the fact that it isn't a one size fits all policy across agroecological zones, but different farmers um, 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 have got different opportunities and we need to, to fit advice um, um, uh, in, in a sort of co-creation way uh, with farmers. And just so that you can, you can see, that is the, the upland uh, uh, catchment, and you can see it, it splits actually into sort of uh, two in a way. You've got one which has got quite a large bit of the biodiversity hotspot of the Knuckles um, uh, range, the Knuckles forest. And, you know, that really is a sort of forest and landscape restoration type context. There's, a, there's, a, there's quite a big forest area. Most of it actually... Uh, rather degraded uh, plantation pine forest, as well as um, the, the uh, uh, um, natural forest that remains. And a lot of that has got cardamom as an understory as a result of, of, of in, in incursion. But then you've got um, a, a, another area which has got a huge amount of um, degraded tea and, and other plantation crops. So it's basically um, uh, really about agroecological uh, intensification. It's a $50 million uh, project 
uh, 10 million uh, coming from that levy for the payment for environmental services scheme through the government and a 40 million grant from um, uh, uh, GCF. Um, and it's part of a broader national program to develop a green economy um, uh, in Sri Lanka. And please do not be put off by the false uh, narrative that has been around Sri Lanka um, uh, uh, regarding the, the um, uh, movement away from um, uh, inorganic fertilizer. What happened, uh, and, and I was with the president shortly before he disappeared, <laughs> disappeared um, uh, it is uh, that the farmers were being given inorganic fertilizer free. It was a subsidy uh, to farmers. When uh, the balance of payments, the, the foreign exchange availability became uh, uh, tight, um, uh, it was no longer possible to afford to, to give uh, farmers that free uh, subsidy. Um, and uh, that then led to a switch to ban uh, imports um, in order to switch to domestically produced uh, organic uh, alternatives. Uh, and of course, doing that abruptly um, was not um, um, uh, either possible or, or um, um, uh, and, and didn't work well. But um, in terms of the overall forward um, look in the country now, um, the development of sustainable um, agriculture, keeping that water storage capacity and uh, getting mechanisms to get more um, um, uh, economic uh, uh, flows back uh, to sustain uh, the landscapes that provide the water um, is, is critical going forwards. Okay, that's Sri Lanka. Let's move to Andhra Pradesh. Uh, I'll, I'll just say a couple of things and then and then leave it to Swati. Um, the the TPP has had an interaction with RYSS in um, uh, Andhra Pradesh for a while. Um, and it's a supportive one. So uh, uh, one we're going to talk about here is the co-impact systems change um, um, grant, uh, which is $15 million. Uh, and the TPP helped RYSS. We, in fact, brought them into the process and then uh, developed uh, a program. But very much related to systems change. And I think it's really important. And the co-impact system change framework is a really great way of thinking about things. And it starts with systems of today and, and systems of tomorrow. Um, uh, you are probably all familiar with natural farming um, in Andhra Pradesh. Um, and we, one of the first things that we did was actually to bring scientists, including from, from Reading University in the UK um, and from uh, ICAR and other places in India, together with practitioners of natural farming, to look at what was the common understanding of the agroecological uh, um, uh, transformations that were being um, promoted um, and what people knew about them or thought about them. And that was a really exciting exchange of information with um, practitioners and, and scientists not always agreeing by any means, but we could come up with an overall framework, which is like a hypothesis of how um, natural farming uh, interventions affect um, crop yield, carbon accumulation, and resilience to, uh, to, to drought, floods, and cyclones, which is what um, um, were, were the key uh, uh, aspects. And that led to the, the first reliable yield data um, from uh, right across the state, showing that transitions from uh, uh, conventional farming to natural farming don't necessarily, don't, don't result in uh, uh, a yield reduction. And that was quite a significant uh, result, uh, which was published uh, last year. And uh, in a moment, I'm going to hand over to uh, uh, Swati because this is um, uh, the systems diagram that shows what was um, um, uh, basically the situation constraining um, um, uh, what is happening in terms of uh, agroecological transformation. So just so that you can read the diagram, the green bits there 
are groups of actors in key partner organizations that form a, a, a dis-enabling or an enabling environment. So you've got the research extension and education systems, you've got policies, and you've got the private sector um, um, and how uh, it operates. Uh, leading to, to negative perception of, of natural farming, um, patchy access to knowledge about it. Um, and then uh, you, you've got markets that aren't functioning in a way that uh, uh, makes natural farming uh, attractive to, to farmers. And at the practice level, which is what we've been uh, focused on uh, uh, earlier today, high input costs, low prices, use of environmentally disruptive chemicals, unstable productivity from year to year, and, and long-term uh, reductions. Obviously, that results in low net incomes, indebtedness, poverty, and, and malnourishment. So these yellow, uh, sorry, th these um, um, uh, uh, yellow things are directly influenced by uh, RYS, uh, uh, RYSS activity, what RYSS is doing, and the blue shows uh, measurable indicators, in that case, uh, uh, low net income. The orange is a bit difficult to distinguish, but climate change and norms like the caste system and patriarchy that has, has a real problem in terms of uh, the agency of women farmers in the system. Those are really difficult to change because um, whatever you do, um, um, they're, they're, they're quite resistant to change, but we know that they're important. And then, of course, you can flip this around uh, in order to say, well, what is it that you need to do? What, what, what is the future that you want to see in this system? Obviously, different <laughs> uh, organization of research engines, uh, education, um, uh, enabling policies, and a private sector uh, that's operating in a, uh, in a different way. Swati, I've said enough. Uh, let me hand over the microphone to you. Thank you so much, sir. Namaste, everyone. Um, I'm Swati. Uh, I've been working with the Andhra Pradesh program since the last seven years. And it's been a year and a half now I'm working with Ferguson and the craft team. Uh, and working still in Andhra Pradesh. And then now we are moving to national and international. See, one of the big questions uh, I've been pondering since morning is this question of transformation you're talking agroecological transformation, but nobody has questioned, we are not questioning about the lapsability, that a farmer transforming to agroecology, is he, is he or she going to lapse back? Why, what we are addressing with systems change is the lapsability, because we have seen, because uh, for the program in RYSS, that the, the mo because most of the agroecological projects are project-based, donor-based, the moment the project funding stops, the, the, the knowledge goes out of the system. The knowledge goes out of the program and the farmer switches back to chemical farming has been our experience. How do we ensure that this lapsability of agroecological transformation does not happen? And there are three crucial elements. We need to ensure as a project or program or systems thinking, three things, inclusivity, equity, and sustainability. If your end measures of indicators are these three, that is when the systems thinking approach is in place. So our entire agenda, if you see this diagram also, it's actually addressing all these three elements. So that tomorrow, if Swati is not there, so tomorrow, the, because of the political change, the government, RYSS, ceases to exist. The knowledge that is the agroecological knowledge stays in the program. And that is what the systems thinking approach that we have brought in our voices has changed the entire lenses because still now I till today I call we call it the Andhra Pradesh Community Managed Natural Farming Program. A program cannot solve all the problems of the farmers and the livelihoods. So we are shifting from a program based organization to a systems thinking organization, and this operates at three level at the people level, at the systems level, and at the program level. We have to make changes in all the three and. This co-impact fund that uh, Ferguson mentioned that has brought that $15 million is going to address this. In the next five years, we are going to shift from us and, and depict, demonstrate to the world how systems change organizations in food system and agroecology works. So at the people's level, we are talking about we need to build capacities of the communities. And that is what I've been see, seeing since morning that how are we able as scientists and researchers are able to communicate to the whatever research has been done to the communities. First is second. Second is 
engendering engendering what we have realized that women understand agroecology better they adopt it sooner this is this is anecdotally slash by research has been true how do we engender agroecology one of the big questions that people pose against agroecology is that it increases the drudgery of women that is a completely false narrative because the moment you give knowledge to the women they become central to the agricultural and system which the conventional agriculture system have kept them apart this is a story in majority of the asian countries i'm i don't know what africa's agriculture and social dynamics looks like so women comes into the center and there the drudgery part which people people say that is uh, deterrent to the agroecology adoption is actually they increase the value of women in the entire agroecological e ecosystem so at the people level this is addressed and the role of civil society organizations becomes predominant here what at systems change level systemic level we are looking at is policy changes so we are talking about the bottom and the approach uh, and the top down approach as well policies how are you going to change the winning coalitions the co impact has time and again said with partnerships winning coalition that is when uh, ferguson mentioned we are systems of today and to reach systems of to together only one program cannot change the entire system you need to people need to come together partners need to come together organizations need to come together and talk about it so third thing is only one program focused on transformation cannot happen the education department has to talk about it the health department has to talk about it the political system have to talk so the entire system has to talk about it one program one project one norad cannot change it we we are fooling ourselves if we want to talk about the scales and the systems of future and the last but not the least because i'm uh, very aware of the time also is that program level how do we bring changes what we have realized is that science research and evidence is extremely crucial and that is the reason we are working in the indo german global academy for agroecology research and learning we do not want knowledge to be with icar institutes you know the sole sole you know sole bearer of agriculture research in india we want communities knowledge to come in forefront because that is the uh, spirits and ethos of agroecology how do we uh, convert this pseudo science to actual scientific science and that is what uh, ferguson has been mentioning the agroecology tpp is talking how do we do science differently how do we take agroecology research from laboratory to landscapes to people who are actually doing natural farming or agroecology thank you